Hey guys, this video is a little long, so I've pinned the chapters in the comments below. Compared to the last video, this video is gonna be a bit more serious, but for the next one, I promise I'll do a fun one. Anyway, here we go. So, last week, Asmund Gold dropped this banger. Artists' opinions don't matter. It just doesn't matter. Because what matters is the opinion of the people that are buying the product. He also prophesied the emotional outbursts of man children on Twitter over the next day or two will subside. First off, respectfully, as a hobby artist, screw you. But you know what? He's actually not wrong. Don't click off yet. Let me tell you something! Allow me this moment to play devil's advocate. Now, I'll be focusing mostly on the words artists' opinions don't matter because this is what seems to have stung artists the most. I feel like a lot of people may have misunderstood what he meant and took it as artists don't matter in the overall scope of things from product creation to product delivery. Now, from my standpoint, I refuse to believe he actually believes that artists don't matter. And while it's an L take to be sure, that opinion certainly does exist out there in the world. And as a viewer of As been golds for a few months now, I don't think he actually believes that. Now for fellow artists out there, I think it goes without saying that we are quite protective over our work. Even more so in this environment where AI generated images are flooding sites like ArtStation, DeviantArt, Instagram, and Twitter. These were websites that artists used to be able to thrive in. And we've heard multiple times from many people, from friends, to families, to strangers, that art doesn't bring value, that it's useless, you're gonna be broke for the rest of your life, go be a doctor, nurse, lawyer, computer scientist, astronaut. And I'll be honest here, we probably should have listened. But then we take a step back and look at things in entertainment, for example, like anime, video games, animated films, and we all know that that's not true. You can make money off of art and that there are careers based around art. Art's one of, not the only reason, why we have banger games like Hades, Baldur's Gate 3, and the Final Fantasy series. Art's also one of the reasons why we have beautiful cinematics and animated films such as those that come from Blizzard, Square Enix, and one of my favorite animated films, Enter the Spider-Verse. So when artists hear the phrase, artists' opinions don't matter, there is a bit of ego at play when it comes to how some would react. Which is one of the main reasons why, in my point of view, Asmongold got absolutely dogpiled on Twitter with Carla Ortiz even chiming in. Remember this name later, cause she's very big in the entertainment industry. Anyway, let's go back to artists' opinions don't matter. Now, Asmund Gold's already explained this, but all that statement really meant was that to the general population who don't dabble in art or don't care much for it, it's only the gift wrap of a product. And here's the thing, consumers don't know if that product may or may not be garbage. Here's a screenshot from his response video to the drama. All the customers really care about is the overall quality of the end product. As we, or at least most of us know, humans are visual beings. It is, after all, one of the reasons why we have survived this long, sadly. It's the reason why, for example, when we see someone for the first time and we think they're attractive, we become enamored by them. But once you actually get to know them and realize they're not who you thought they were, and not in a good way, you start side-eyeing them. And while they might be attractive, you'll always be reminded of the not-so-pretty side of them. A bit of a Dorian Gray situation. Another example, how many times have you opened a loot box in a game and got visually stimulated by a colored beam of light, indicating a higher quality item, only to find that it's not a skin, but a spray or a voice line for a character that you don't even use? Obviously, you would shout horseshit and feel a little scammed. But let's get back to art. I'm going to bring up two big games and you probably know where I'm going with this, Baldur's Gate 3 and Diablo 4. Now both games have beautiful artistic direction, and for a good number of people, I think with a combination of nostalgia, a crave for the genre, and the gift wrap we call art, a combination of these factors would have been enough to make them purchase the game. Both games are visually appealing when it comes to character designs, environment, and special effects, but these aspects of the product can only take you so far when there are inherent flaws in the product's core design. And as we know, the core design of a game is gameplay. Guess which game fumbled the ball in that department? On one hand, you've got Baldur's Gate 3, whose team did every single step right ever since it was in early access back in 2020. And when Larian Studios finally released the game, there were praises all over, and I think the awards they won should speak for themselves. As both an artist and a consumer, pretty gift wrap as plus gift. 
On the other hand, Diablo 4, while visually stunning and, to be honest, I prefer the art style here a bit more, the gameplay wasn't fulfilling and personally, there were a bit too many things about the gameplay that irked me, and I believe a lot of people will share the same sentiments about the game. A couple of examples, storage space, which as far as I know, they still haven't fixed, the mount only being available after you've done about 70% of the game, roadblocks that are inconvenient for your mount, where you have to dismount and mount again, with the horse being on cooldown. Then they added the dungeon teleport function, which is useful, but it also rendered the horse useless to some degree. Each class having certain builds that are the only ones that are viable or fun, don't even remind me about how they nerfed sorcerer to the ground. Endgame being bland and unfulfilling, leveling issues, the list goes on. Diablo, in its essence, is an ARPG game where replayability is what keeps the players going and keeps the game alive. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I understand it, too many inconveniences in a game's design will cause players to drop the game. The art by itself, no matter how beautiful, will not bring the player back. As an artist and a consumer, pretty gift wrap doodoo gift. I hope you're seeing the point here because when it comes to a whole product, to the consumer, the visuals can only take a product so far. If it's a faulty product, most consumers will think, screw the art, it's pretty, but I'm not playing. And I know I'm focusing on games here a little bit, so let's take it to the kitchen for example. Matter of fact, let's go to Salt Bay's restaurant where he covers steak and gold. It looks pretty, but from the reviews we've seen, it's really not that great. Once again, pretty gift wrap, not a great product. Another point as Mon Gold made is that like if you're at a um uh, if if you are stranded on an island, would you rather have a cooler full of food or would you rather have a uh uh would you rather have the Mona Lisa? And I think that that's what makes art special is the fact that it has value, but the value is not intrinsic. This is a point I would like to agree with to some extent, but I would like to expand this to say that art doesn't have an intrinsic value to consumers if it's just a still image by itself. Now, unless you actively seek and engage with art-related content, you wouldn't know names like Sandus Arts, Ross Draws, Gooey's, Greg Rutkowski, and Mark Burnett to name a few. But compare it to singers or bands and rappers whose fans range from your elementary school kid to the elderly who likes to wild out, regular people who don't really dabble in visual art, a visual artist's biggest fan will most of the time be another visual artist. And even then in the music circle, right? Unless you actively engage in a genre of space, you wouldn't know names like Sleep Theory, Corday, Miyachi, or Red Velvet. Now here's my perspective on why the general public seems to value music more than visual art. Unlike visual art, music is something you can passively engage with in order to get some form of entertainment. For example, background noise, setting the mood, getting hype when you're training, or listening to what another rapper has to say to another rapper. And for the most part, music seems to have more access to your senses, even more so when the music uses a form of visual art as an accessory. For example, music videos. Visual artists, on the other hand, don't really have it that easy. Let's do a little experiment here. Which of these two engages with you more? This? Or this? Come here, little man, let me talk with you. See if I can paint for you the large picture. Let me know in the comments. If a visual artist wants to become well known to the public, in my observations, they have to give something more, such as being able to draw in a familiar and well-known style. And even then, if an artist is working on a project for like Disney for example, the general public is going to associate the art and the style with the company, not the individual artist. Now for the general audience who really wants to know about the artists who worked on the project are, they will actively seek info and for most people this isn't really the case. Which brings me to the next point I'm about to make, which may have had a bit of a role to play when it comes to the reactions. Artists are exhausted. While a single piece of artwork is nice to look at, in the age of digital and social media where everything is fast paced and people's senses need to be stimulated constantly, unless it's a meme, one still image is not enough. We've heard all these sentiments in the artist space. Instagram and Twitter aren't what they used to be, the algorithm is against me, and it's hard to grow on this platform, it's impossible to grow if you didn't start posting art before 2020. 
And in my opinion, it's really that last one that is the general sentiment in the art community with few exceptions like Sanders Arts and Kuleen to name a few. Gone are the days where artists like Gu Weiz and Wolop can post art to Instagram when it was primarily an art and photography platform. The days where they can consistently grow a following just from still images. Nowadays, the platform is primarily used as brainless hee hee ha ha funny entertainment and as a marketing tool for businesses. If you don't believe me, scroll down on your feed and see how long it takes for either a suggested post or a reel or an ad to pop up. And this is something that artists are trying to cash in on, grow a following so they can sell products from their art business. Now what makes the artists previously mentioned stand out is while well, yes, they have a large following and have subjectively good art, it's because they offer something more, whether it's content through YouTube, creating entertaining reels every day, courses they sell, or art books they've created. The point I'm trying to make here is, on Instagram and Twitter, more often than not, an artwork by itself, a still image, is not going to have high value by itself. Unfortunately, when regular people see a piece of artwork, if they like what they see, they drop a like. If you're lucky, they repost. If you hit the jackpot, they follow. And perhaps the rarest form of engagement for artists is if someone actually visits your profile to check out your other stuff, and then they scroll away. This all happens within the span of 10 seconds, maybe even shorter. Now, keeping up with the modern age demands of artists is undoubtedly exhausting. You have to keep up with commissions that take days or weeks, especially if the client doesn't respond or pay on time, posting reels and videos, posting content, staying on top of trends, on top of applying to companies to fight for a position in the art department and for some working part-time jobs while having to live with the fear of being axed at any given moment. We saw that happen earlier this month. It's all obnoxiously exhausting. Now, I've already established that in my view, Asman Gold doesn't mean that artists' opinions don't matter in every single case. It's only in the case of a consumer's opinion of a product. Asmon Gold may come off as an asshole. Maybe he is, I don't know him personally, but I also refuse to believe that he thinks artists' opinions don't matter when it comes to, for example, project direction and workers' rights. As you all know, AI image generation has been the center of many controversies in regards to ethics, morals, and whether or not it should be included in project workflows. Artists, whether it's voice actors, writers, or musicians, but mostly visual artists from what I've seen, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, have been at the forefront of combating usage of AI in artistic projects, which is the reason why there was the months-long sag after a strike last year, which in the end, funnily enough, maybe not. sag after recently signed a deal to okay the usage of the voice of voice actors for AI training, and they said that they contacted VAs through email about this decision and were given the green light. Thing is, the VAs let it be known on Twitter that they never were contacted apparently and are rightfully pissed. The f*** was all that striking for then? Now let's talk about Carla Ortiz, an artist I mentioned earlier in the video. I hope you remembered her name. She is a force to be reckoned with in the art industry. She has worked on projects and games like Rogue One, World of Warcraft, and Marvel to name a few. She has been, for the past year or so, bitten vocally against Gen AI in its current state. Last part there is key, in its current state. She is also one of the spokespeople of a lawsuit against Gen AI companies such as Stable Diffusion alongside other artists. I'm not sure if the entire team is just in the visual field or if they're in the music and writing industry as well. All I know is that the lawsuit itself mainly focuses on copyright issues, artist compensation, and artists' rights when it comes to the workspace, as well as raising issues on how Gen AI data is trained. Again, I'm not too well versed on the whole thing, and I'm not going to pretend that I am. I haven't read the lawsuit they submitted, it's over 900 pages long, from what I've heard. And I've only ever seen tidbits of what Ms. Ortiz has been posting to Twitter, and it's not a fight that I know much about to make a informed comment. All I know, again, is that they're fighting to keep the money flowing for artists. And this is where artists' opinions do matter, because it is, after all, their livelihoods and they should be able to protect how they put food on the table. Artists are one of the biggest reasons why we have so much entertainment to choose from. As it currently stands, visual artists have been thrown under the bus time and again with very few ways to protect their work. 
unlike for example copyrighted material in music and TV and movies or literary estates. And artists have tried to find protection in their own way, mainly through watermarks. In their current form, we've seen AI models remove partially or completely artists' watermarks when generating images and copy styles down to a T. As it currently stands, visual artists need any win they can get. Artists like Sanders Arts, who is also vocally against AI images, made a video about AI. I'll post his bit in the description. He explains the current situation very well. But he himself said, I do want AI to be part of our future, but just not this current version of it. The biggest issue he has with AI is that these gen AI companies have made it automatically opt-in for all artists. What this means is that the companies, the gen AI companies, have taken everything available on the internet regardless of copyright. And the only way for artists to quote unquote take their art out of the trading pool is if they sign an opt-out request which rarely gets looked at, if ever. As a response to the video, Sam had his work used to train AI models in mass with prompters even going as far as holding a competition to see who would make the best gen AI image using his style. They even went through the trouble of sending the images to his business email. So I think it goes without saying that when it comes to a collective opinion, artists want better protection for their work. And from both Carla Ortiz's lawsuit and Sanders Arts's video, opt-out is not enough, opt-in needs to be implemented. With opt-in meaning that the AI companies need to ask for permission to use their work. And this is the part where a tech project from the University of Chicago comes in, the Glaze project. Now, the project offers a bit of a lifeline to artists where they have developed two programs to, in a sense, protect their work from being used to train AI models. These two programs are Glaze and Nightshade. As far as I understand it, Glaze provides defenses against style copying, while Nightshade injects images with data poison to basically mess with the AI models if the artwork is used to train. Ever since Gen AI blew up, artists have been told repeatedly to adapt or die. Now, thanks to the team behind the Glaze project, artists have adapted just in a way that inconveniences Gen AI models. Now, does this mean that there's going to be a bit of a tech war when it comes to training AI? I really don't know, but if anything, big ups to the artists because they are not taking adapt or die bending over. Finally, let's address the delivery of artists' opinions don't matter. I know I keep jumping back to this, but I swear after this, I'm going to end the video. To the general population, especially today in this environment, this sounds combative, and this next part isn't coming from Asmund Gold himself, but from me, coming from someone who has a bit of experience in the hospitality industry, and someone who can sometimes come across as blunt. Early on, when I was taking an internship in a hotel, I was in a setting where I actually didn't know the local language and only had English as my tool. And it really didn't help that I looked like a majority of the client base of the hotel. You probably know which nationality. Stereotyping, I know, but bear with me. So frequently, I would be approached by guests who would ask me something in a Chinese dialect, but I would then ask them in response in English if they could speak English. Most of the time, the guests would look shocked and go to another employee. But sometimes, if the guest I was talking to could speak English, they would look offended and start speaking in English. I wouldn't necessarily say angrily, but aggressively. After this happened a few times, I decided to switch my approach and instead tell the guests that I could only speak English by telling them Ingman, which if I remember correctly is English and Cantonese. I'm not sure if like the, most of the guests that I had could understand it, but that's how I got my point across. Now, the guests would still look shocked and move to another employee, but this time, if they could speak English, they would be more receptive and accepting and repeat the question in English. The point of this story is to say that how you go about getting your point across will be received differently by people. Compare the wording between can you speak English and I can only speak English. One places the problem on the person, one places the problem on yourself. They both essentially get to the same destination, it's just that one road is a bit bumpier. There are billions of people out there with billions of different ways of operating. Miscommunication is the biggest cause of a misunderstanding. And that's what we saw with Asmund Gold's Opinion Gate. Now I'm not asking Asmund Gold to change his approach or change his opinion, it would be impossible to do. Nor am I asking the people who understandably became upset at his opinion to change their mind, that is also impossible to do. And I am most definitely not invalidating anyone when it comes to what I have said in this video. 
All I'm saying is, artists' opinions do matter, it's just that not everyone in the world will share that opinion. Because, after all, an artist's biggest fan is always going to be another artist, and to them, artists' opinions may matter more than most. Which is why we have people like Carla Ortiz fighting to keep artists in the workforce. Alright, well that's it for this video, I know it got a little doom and gloomy, but for the next one, I'll do something fun. Anyway, see ya.